I'm Gary Mavis, and I've had a lifelong obsession with classic cars. I caught the bug when I was just a small child, but since then I've been lucky enough to own and restore many of these rare beauties. Over the years I've learnt how to tackle the complex mechanics of these cars, but still managed to indulge my passion along the way. But now I want to share my experiences with you, revealing the joys, the trials and the tribulations of classic car restoration. Each episode I'll meet fellow classic car enthusiasts to hear their stories, look at their cars and share their personal experiences. So come with me on my journey as I search from here to Europe and as far as the USA for the cars of my dreams. Discover their unique histories whilst working on them bring them back to life. So join me, Gary Mavis, a classic obsession. So since last time I've been getting stuck into another couple of jobs. First I had to replace my heater matrix which had just decided to start leaking all over the passenger footwell. Although the matrix itself is nicely accessible, situated in the engine bay, this is by no way an easy task. As hampered by space, you've literally got to be a contortionist to navigate the heater control rods through the heater box without damaging them. Another job which was probably done at the factory before the engine was fitted to the car. So with the box nicely painted up, and the matrix itself record. It's then refitted and another job is ticked off the list. Another job I decided to address were the car's rear wheel bearings. In my opinion, after a car's 16 year layup, these would invariably be dried up and totally shot. Probably due to the car's binding brakes. So luckily I've replaced them before the car's maiden voyage. Okay guys, so now to the job in hand. The Rolls Royce Coney soft top. Probably never been attempted by the normal humble home mechanic like ourselves, but I'm gonna give it a go. Uh, now, back in the day, I read that it took two or three guys, maybe two or three weeks back at the factory. It was a very complex job, as although they were similar, because they were hand-built, no two cars were exactly the same. And of course, being a Rolls-Royce, and as a mark of their craftsmanship and quality, and of course, to justify the enormous price tag on the car at the time, nothing could be short of perfect, so, do you reckon, mate? Wish me luck. So the wooden bow I ordered from Hungary finally arrives. And on close inspection it's really well made. It'll probably just need a few little minor trims and adjustments. And then I'll get it to fit a treat. I then cover the wooden bowl with a thin foam. I cut the holes out for the lights. I then cover it with the West of England cloth to match the headlining, using a special heat resistant glue. The lights are then refitted. And fresh wiring is run through the wood. I then fit new electrical connectors, crimp into place, then complete the job with heat shrink ends for safety. Connect the back up again and we're good to go. 
I then move on to the hood at the rear that was rotted and made up from bits of hardwood I have sitting round. I shape it carefully and fit it so the rear of the soft top has something to staple into. I then set about cleaning the metal bows of the frame itself and on closer inspection I see where leather or canvas torsion straps have been previously fitted to evenly separate the bows and also support the canvas or vinyl soft top that once lay above. I also figure out that the remnants of a thin piece of plywood on the back of the steel bow was used to staple the headliner up. A little bit of heat and a bit of muscle and the stubborn screws are finally removed. So with the bows freshly primed and painted, I then fit the new pieces of plywood to take the staples from the headlining. I then move on to the front of the hood frame. And along with everything else, when the wood is removed, I see it's in pretty shabby condition. On closer inspection I see there's an inch and a half piece of felt fit between each piece and the frame to act as a kind of cushion and seal. process of disassembly begins. All the covering is removed. along with the glue. And the chrome is clean within an inch of its life. With the surface clean, the glue is then applied. Ready for the West of England cloth covering. And the front bow, which appears to be in really good condition, is given exactly the same treatment.
By my reckoning, with this material I should allow for about half an inch give between the two metal bows of the hood frame and pull tightly. So with this in mind, the measurements between the two bows and the material pegged in place, I can basically work out where the seam needs to go. But remember during this whole process, cleanliness is key. Hands must be washed regularly and if the material scrapes on the floor or picks up any dirt, it's back to the drawing board. After rechecking my measurements, I mark it out with Taylor's chalk. Then I nervously start to cut the expensive material, hoping that my calculations are correct. So for the first time ever on the mother-in-law's old sewing machine, and after a 30 second tutorial from the missus on how to load the bobbin, wish me luck and away we go. I then begin the laborious job of carrying this ridiculously heavy material from the house to the garage, clipping it up, back onto the frame, which each time takes around 45 minutes, then wrap it up again, back into the machine again, remark, re-sew. But this material is fantastic to work with. I probably liken it to the fabric that's used on an expensive men's overcoat. Strong, soft, warm and durable. I found one of the most difficult things to get right was following the seam to the same shape as the bow. You can see where it comes down at the edges. When I'm happy my seams are correct and straight, I then restitch along the same seam for extra strength and durability. If this hood is gonna last another 50 years, then it's gotta be right. I then turn my attention to making the panels that fit in the hood recess behind the rear seat. These are then fitted with a thin layer of sponge. Then again with the West of England cloth. So when I'm happy that my seams are straight, everything's taut with no wrinkles, I staple the headliner to the bows, into the plywood strips I fitted earlier. Then the excess material is trimmed off. I then make up a couple of thin aluminium strips and drill them through. Pulling the curtain down tight, this then enables me to screw into the wooden slats that I made and fitted to the hood recess in an earlier episode. For me, this just finishes the job off nicely. How neat is that? And after taking the hood up and down a few times, just to make sure there's no movement, I'm now happy this is a great foundation for the hood that's going over the top.
The rear window is centralized and fitted, making sure that when the hood is fully erect, the window is tight and wrinkle free. I then make the hood padding using three quarter inch sponge covered by a cotton sheet. In hindsight, maybe I should have used like a quilt type substance filled with hollow fiber. This normally gives a better look, but if it's something I'm not happy with, I can always rectify this at a later date. And just to prevent any imperfections on the front bow and to give that seamless look, I decided to finish off with some horsehair. Then finally, on with the hood. And just one last tip for those of you out there who are brave enough to have a go themselves. Trim off any excess material that's not needed and make sure the hood padding is not too thick. As when recessed, the hood will simply stick up too high and prevent you from fitting your hood boot or cover. For the torsion cables, I use simple bicycle brake cables. These work perfectly. And once fed through the hood and tightened up, we're almost done. When I'm happy with the hood fit, it's carefully stapled into the wood at the bottom and all excess material is trimmed off with a blade. But be careful not to slip or it's job over. Then I eventually finish off by covering the staples in the trimmed edge with a black canvas beading which also fixes by stapling through the middle. I then get the canvas so tight that I can barely close the catches of the hood. And only then do I fix it into place with staples. This is a way of guaranteeing that when the hood finally wears in and settles, it won't become saggy or loose. When I eventually get round to the wood, I start by carefully picking off the lacquer with the sharp blade. I then give it a quick sand, a light stain, and then after 12 coats of two pack lacquer, I flat it and polish it on the machine. Good enough for me. The door panels and wood are refitted. And after a belt change, a water pump, and a new viscous fan, we're ready to go. So as we near the end of our journey, a message to all you dreamers out there. Don't be fooled into thinking this can be done in just a weekend. Rome wasn't built in a day. But if you're brave enough and you put your mind to it, you take your time with a bit of common sense. Then I'm a strong believer that anything can be achieved. Beautifully light, lovely gear changes, plenty of power. I mean, look at that. Wow. Wow. This is luxury at its very height. I mean, you could be anywhere in a car like this. You could be in the south of France, the Riviera wafting down through Spain. I mean, this is just like pure imagination at its best.
This car makes me smile. It's hard to believe a car that started production as a two-door shadow Mulliner Park Ward in 1965. With its huge price tag and a 6.75 litre engine. In all its opulence, miraculously survives the petrol and oil strikes and severe austerity of the 1970s. Finally end production some 30 years later, in 1995. The way it glides effortlessly. The way it stands. The chrome tick on the quarter light. The coat bottle swages on the rear wings, oozing with style. Each carefully thought out design just screams of the perfect gentleman's steed. I'm thrilled with the way the hood turned out. It's simple. I just wouldn't have been happy to pay for somebody else's really expensive mistake. Sitting in the vaulted cockpit with the hood up. You could actually be forgiven for thinking you were at the wheel of a coupe rather than a ragtop. with its silent magic carpet ride and sit up and beg stance on acceleration. Whether it's Geneva, Monte Carlo, Hollywood, or the classiest hotels in the world. A car that not just exudes class, but demands respect wherever it goes. The creme de la creme of British car manufacturing. Timeless, pure quintessential Britishness. Thank you for watching this episode of Gary Mather's Classic Obsession. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. And join me next time when I visit some old friends and unearth another British motoring classic, the Jaguar XJS V12.